Hey, let's dive in today's message. Um, I want to say this, that so many people are talking about why they love their church. I love our church because we are a dying church. You're like, what, what, what? We're a dying church, and I love that. And no, it's not that we're dying in attendance or our numbers are declining because we're not. We're doing all the other things. They're all the opposite things. We're growing uh, on levels, but, but it, I believe this growth is because we're dying, right? Um, and you're like, Robbie, you, did you have a stroke? I don't know what's going on with you because you're not making sense right now. And I want to I remind you of a Bible verse, Romans 8, 13. It's not on your outline, but it's just a verse that I want to remind you of. It says, if you live according to the flesh you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. I want to pastor a dying church. Make sense? Paul said it this way, that we ought to crucify ourselves. Paul even said that he dies daily. Paul realizes and introduces, uh, introduces this idea that as a believer, the moment you get saved, it's not over, it's just begun. Um, and this idea that God can give you a new life. You profess that when you step in the baptistry, right? You go down and say the old person is dead, and then up comes the new person who's going to live for Jesus. It's what you profess, right? And so, so I want to pastor a dying church. I want to pastor a church that is full of believers that are crucifying their flesh, that are, are following Jesus in a big, bold way. And so... Um, before we get into the text, though, I got to share. I got to share a verse with you because I don't want you to get this sermon twisted. I don't want you to get this mixed up or messed up in your head. And so, let's look at, at Ephesians two eight and nine. If somebody's been saved for a while. You're like, oh, I got this. I just then bear with me, right? Just bear with me as others might not get this. I don't want them to get this twisted. And understand, there's going to be a pop quiz the moment we finish reading the text together. All right. Pop quiz. We're going to see if you understand this text. Pop quiz. For by what? Grace. You have been faith. through faith. This is not of your own what? Grace. This is a gift of? God. Who gave it to you? God. Who earned it for you? God. All right. Not a result of? So that no one may? Because we are a bunch of braggers. Let me show you pictures of my grandkids. We'll brag, right? We are braggers. We brag about our cars. We brag about everything. But one thing you cannot brag about is your salvation. It is a gift of God, the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. Pop quiz time. Can you save yourself? Will God allow you into heaven because you changed the way you live your life? Because you became a better father, because you became a better mother, a better wife, because you became a better student, because you became a better citizen, because you're not like the person you used to be. Will God just let you into heaven for that? No. no. And here's the reality. If that was the case, Jesus wouldn't have had to die. You understand that God took his most valuable thing, which was his child, and he nailed him to a cross to pay for your sins. The Bible says that all have sinned. The Bible says that the penalty of sin is death. Jesus Christ died on a cross that you wouldn't have to one day. If you could save yourself, if you could get yourself into heaven by the way you live your life, he would not have sacrificed his son. I'm telling you, I have two sons and, and um, four grandchildren. I would give none of them for you. Don't hate me. You wouldn't give me your kids. You wouldn't give up your child for me. My children or grandchildren would not be sacrificed for your soul, but God thought differently. For while you were still in your sins, Christ died for the ungodly. That's what the Bible says. He's God. I'm not. I wouldn't give any of my kids or grandchildren for you. I just wouldn't. And you wouldn't give your kids or grandchildren for me. I get it. But God did that so that you could find your way into heaven. There is no other way into heaven, only by Jesus Christ. So nothing I'm saying today is a save yourself message, okay? We're not talking about being saved from God's wrath. We're not talking about going to hell. What we are talking about is living a life that God has called to you. So, so, so much energy and so much effort is to get you to know Jesus. What then, right? Day one of being saved, what do I do? Day one of coming to Christ and, and I wake up the next morning, so I'm saved on a Sunday. What do I do on Monday? That's what we're going to dive into today. Ephesians 1, would you read that with me? Ephesians 1, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to what? Walk. In a manner what? Worthy. He says, walk worthy of the calling to which you've been called, to walk worthy. I'm a little confused. I'm a little confused. Not mad at anybody. 
not angry with anybody. I'm saying I'm confused. I'm confused because so many people profess that they know Jesus, but they're not walking worthy in a manner in which they're called. I feel like you might already know where this sermon is going. I'm confused. I'm confused at how you attend church, but your mouth is awful. Awful. You say you're a believer and you claim to be a Christian, forgiven for your sins, but you hold grudges. Some of you have been holding grudges all the way back to like kindergarten. You know what I'm talking about. You're so mad at this individual, you're so mad at this person, and you've been mad all the way through high school. You've been mad all the way through for the last four years. You've been angry since the divorce. The divorce was eight years ago, and you're still holding a grudge. You're still angry. I'm confused because that doesn't line up with walking worthy in a manner in which you're called. Well, pastor, let me help you understand. You don't understand. You go to work at the church, and you got this impression that I don't have issues in my life either. You got that misimpression. So you're going to clarify it for me. And so so let's just hear the clarification. Why do you live like hell? Why is that? Why is there so little life change? Why is there so much unforgiveness? Why is there so much gossip, slander? Why is there drunkenness? Why is there unforgiveness? Why is that? Well, let me, pastor, let me explain it to you. I wish you would. He's still working on me. (laughs) Amen. But how many sermons do you got to hear about it? How long does it got to take for you to quit this whatever? You fill in the blank. Oh, he's still working on me, Pastor. You don't understand. (laughs) I guess I don't. Or how about this? People won't listen to me unless I talk to them using this language, right? I'm in a place, I hear this from law enforcement, I hear this from so many of you that aren't even in law enforcement. You'll say, well, I talk this way because at certain times when I get frustrated, people don't listen unless I talk this way. You just don't understand. Really? I guess I'm right, I don't understand. Well, you've never been in that position. Hmm, well, I'm a guy in authority. I have people who work for me. I have a family that I'm responsible for, and I don't have to raise my voice and cuss and scream for somebody to listen to me. I guess I don't understand. How is it that bitter and sweet water come from the same well? How is it that blessing and cursing comes from the same mouth? I don't understand. Well, pastor, I do the things that my friends do, my unsaved friends do. I do the very things because I don't want them to feel judged by me. (laughs) Newsflash. They probably appreciate that you don't, you know, point out their sin and point your little pointy finger in their face and tell them to go into hell. But behind your back, they're judging you. Because you said that you were saved. You said that you're different now. But when they look at your life, you aren't any different. You're afraid of them feeling judged? Well, they're judging you. And they're discounting the message of the gospel because they don't see any change in your life. You might be the very reason why they're not coming to Christ because you're trying to fit in and conform to them. That is not walking worthy in the manner in which we are called. Read the entire chapter of Ephesians. Heck, take take, um, 25 minutes and read the whole book of Ephesians. That is not to what we are called to be. Maybe we, and I'm going to say we, maybe we should be more concerned with what God thinks than what the world thinks of us, right? Maybe we should be asking questions like this. Is it okay that I leave certain sin in my life? Think God is okay with that? The lack of life change that we have in our life? Well, Robbie, you don't understand. I'm saved by grace. We already covered that. We're not talking about being saved. We're talking about because I was saved, now how am I living? What difference has Christ made in my life? Because I'm pretty confused. It's not okay to leave sin in our life, is it? Is yes, is no. Everybody got quiet. (laughs) Is it okay with God? Is it okay that I talk like the world? That I look like the world? That I act like the world? Is that okay? Show me the verse that justifies that. Because in your mind, there's so many ways we justify our sin. I look at this online because my wife doesn't. I talk like this because they have to. There's so many ways we can justify our sin. 
but show me the Bible verse. Because it's time for the church to get back to the Bible. It's time to get into the Bible and say, what does the Bible say? How does my life line up? Is it okay to leave sin in our life, church? Is it okay? Are we even concerned what God thinks of us? I want to show you a couple more verses, a few verses down. Ephesians 4, 20, 24 shows the Christian what they ought to be doing. Not to be saved, but because they are saved. Ephesians 4, 20 says this, that is not the way you learn Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, and the truth is in Jesus, to your old self. What happened to us here? We got awful quiet. Even reading got kind of quiet. Talking about life change and we get quiet. The Bible says we are to put off your old self, which belongs to the former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to renew and be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on, to put on the new self created after the likeness of God. Put off old self, former manner of life. Put on new self and look at the image that is after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. To put off and put on. Since you've been a believer, once you, like, like you need to understand something, when you get saved, you are crossing not the finish line to where you sit down and do nothing, you are crossing the starting line. Because that is the beginning. You were dead in your sins and trespasses, now God has made you alive to Him, and now you're, you're starting your walk with Him, and He's saying there's a putting off and there's a putting on. Put off the old self, put on the new self. The same, the two should not look alike. If I bought a gym membership, and I bought that gym membership, and a year, or heck, six months later, I didn't feel any different or look any different, I'd be questioning what I'm doing. If you are coming to church, and you are claiming to be a Christian, and you don't have a former life that you've put away, I'd be questioning whether I even I'm in the family, whether I'm safe. Let me show you something. There's a guy who did buy a gym membership. His name is Kyle. He told me not to call him a fatty in the he said I called him in a fatty in the first service, and I did not. But look at Kyle. He gave me this info, so don't hate on me. This is Kyle, right? I'm proud of Kyle. Kyle is doing an amazing job, right? Um, 14 months ago, Kyle was 320 pounds. That's not the Kyle we know today, is it? The Kyle know we know today, 14 months later, he's 240 pounds. And we're going to leave this up for just a moment because I want to share something with you about, oh yeah, give him a round of applause. That's awesome. You're welcome, Kyle. I don't know where you're at, but you're welcome, bud. Don't beat me up after search. I'm not calling you fatty. I'm telling you this, that here's the deal with Kyle. Kyle, the old Kyle, before the gym membership, the old Kyle was undisciplined. Undisciplined in his movement, meaning he didn't move very much. Undisciplined in his eating because he ate what he wanted to eat. And when you're undisciplined, 320, that's in your future. That's true for all of us. That's true for every single one of us. And, and you're like, no, preacher, I can eat anything I want. I don't gain a pound. Then you hit 40. <laughs> then you hit 40. Am I lying? Then you hit 40. And all of that changes. Hey, eat it up in your 20s. Eat it up in your 30s. But when you hit 40, that's when it changes, right? And when it changes, guess the image you're becoming. You're becoming the 320 cow. That's what you're going to become. And you don't have to stop there. You can go beyond that. Because undisciplined living, that's what happens. But look at what happens with just a little bit of energy and a little bit of effort. A little bit of discipline. Look what happens. Do you think his life... The 320 to 240 conversion, that, that's not over, by the way. He's still at the gym. He's still eating right, doing the right things, right? But do you think he's happier today or back then? Yeah. And you know that because you see the difference. He's happier today because you see the difference. Now, so many of us use the example, or use the excuse, and we try to justify the lack of that. Well, I, don't, I can't go to the gym because... I can't go to the gym because, well, I don't have the money for the gym. I guarantee you what you're eating, what you do at the grocery store, right, that can go towards a gym membership. I'm not trying to sign you up today, right? I'm not, that's not what I'm doing. I'm just saying you're justifying your bad behavior and undisciplined living 
when life change is so possible. Now, just like Kyle has a before and after, hear me, your spiritual man or your spiritual woman should have a before and after. What are the things that used to define you and how did you used to look, you know, before you met Christ? Paul says to put off those things. There should be a before and an after. A a before I knew Jesus' life and an after I knew Jesus' life. There should be a night and day difference, shouldn't there not? Paul went from arresting Christians and hating Jesus to meeting Jesus and loving Jesus and now kind of trying to spread the gospel so there would be more Christians. A before and an after. What have you put off? What have you put off? Put off pornography, lust, fornication? Selfishness, narcissism, have you put those things off? Gossip, slander, slandering, cussing, have you put those things off? What have you put off? What is the former life? What is that thing that you've crucified? My own personal life? I've put off a lot of things. I have put off anger and unforgiveness. Anger and unforgiveness. I was angry. I got kicked out of my house at age 17. A lot to blame right here. I'm not pointing a finger at anybody. But I was angry at mom. Angry at her. And you know, after I met Jesus, it wasn't very long after I met Jesus, this happened. God started saying to me, you need to call your mom. I've forgiven you. You need to forgive your mother. I had to put off the old self. I couldn't hold on to it anymore. I put off the old self and put on Jesus. Put on forgiveness. And any time I want to get self-righteous or I realize, I mean, I, you know what God did and what he has been doing is still doing? He's bringing me back. All I could remember in that old self, that old Robbie, all he could remember was the day that he left, the day that he was kicked out. That's all he could remember. Whenever I thought of this, in my mom, that's all I thought about was the day when the Williams County Sheriff's Department showed up, when I had to take my sister who was hiding under a pile of clothes in the bed of my truck, who's seven years younger than me, and pick her up out of that bed and set her on the ground and say, you can't go with me. That's all I remembered when I thought of her. But you know what God started doing when I started putting on the new person? When I put the hatred and the bitterness and the anger away and the hurt away, and I started putting on the new self, do you know what? He started reminding me of all the times she took me to baseball games because I was in baseball. All the things that she did, the Cub Scouts and all the other stuff. It's amazing that the old self only remembers certain aspects. One day of a large life where she cared and provided for me. It's amazing to put off and to put on. What have you put off? What have you put on? Love some examples, um, Robbie, because I'm not sure you understand this Christian thing. I thought I could just pray a prayer and be saved and go to heaven and, and that was it. Well, no, when you do pray and you ask God to repent, you repent and you ask God to forgive you. God doesn't repent. You repent and you ask God to forgive you. You are saved and that's the journey. That's the beginning of this journey of being a Christian. The active part of putting off and putting on is what we call sanctification, setting your life apart for God. You become holy because he is holy. Look at this in verse Ephesians 4.29. It was the verse that and I memorized it in the King James because that was the church that, that was the first Bible they gave me when I got saved. And I had an awful mouth. You know what I'm talking about? I cussed and I carried on. I had an awful mouth. And so I can, I can look at that and I understand. Like that was cussing and cursing. That was my normal language. And this is the verse that I put inside of my heart every time I did it because I wanted to be different. I knew there had to be an old person and a new person. So I thought, well, I'm going to start with my language. Ephesians 4.29 says, let no talk come out of your mouth, but only such is good for as fits the occasion that it may give grace to the hearers. Put off corrupt talking, put on building up encouragement. Put off cussing, slander, bitterness, anger, put off all that talking. Put on conversations to build you up. Now, mama did teach me a few things. And you know one of the things that she said, and I bet your mama taught you this too. If you don't have anything nice to say, we might be related after all. (laughs) There's a Smith version that says, shut your mouth or I'll smack it. (laughs) Right? If you ain't got nothing to say, shut your mouth or I'm going to smack it. That's That's the Smith version, you know. Let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth, only 
what can build people up. There's a putting off and a putting on. But, you know, the, the greatest life change verse I've probably ever seen in the entire Bible, it's a single verse, and it's, it's the picture of what a Christian life should be. Ephesians 4, 27. Ephesians 4, 27. Let the thief no longer, but rather let him doing honest with his own hands so that he may have something to what? With anyone in what? To share with anyone in need. Three things happen. Three things happen when you get saved. If these three things happen, I would question whether you are saved. I didn't say three things that you got to start doing. I say three things will happen to you when you are saved if you are truly saved. There's something that you will quit. What did the thief quit? What did the thief quit? Come on. From this verse, he quit stealing, right? Let the thief who stole steal no longer. Instead, let him get a job doing honest work with his own hands that he might have something in need to share with those who are in need, right? That's what the verse said. So here's what happened in the thief life. In the thief's life, here's what happened. He met Jesus. He was convicted of his sin. He realized that he was going to hell one day. The gospel, the power of of salvation to all who believe, struck his heart. And in the moment it struck his heart, he said, God, I am a sinner. The penalty of sin is death. I deserve to die and go to hell. But God, guess what? I understand now that Jesus died in my place. All of my former life, all my thieving, all my dishonest gain, All of that, God, I repent of, and I turn away from my unbelief. I put my faith and trust in you who died for me and rose again. The Bible says let the thief steal no longer. He didn't do that on his own. He met Jesus, and that was the result of him meeting Jesus. You don't believe me? Read the fourth chapter. It's all about life change. Whole book. Man, chapter one, you know, God... Uh, God chose you before the foundation of the world to be in his family. And verse chapter 2 is more like, you know, God loves you so much that it's by grace you're saved, not by your own works. Chapter 4 says, this is what happens when you are saved. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing an honest work. Three things that happen when God saves you. The one, you quit something. You quit something. The thief repented. He repented. When your kids go to Redemption Island back there, this is what they do. This is one of the lessons when my wife is back there. I'll modify it a little bit, but this is the basic of what she's teaching your kids. Maybe we need to teach it in this room. And that is all these kids lined up, right, facing a wall. And that wall is the old self. That wall is sin. And she says, you know, before you know Jesus, you're headed this way. But when you know Jesus, you've got to repent. Repentance isn't feeling sorry. That's not repentance. Repentance is turning around and going a different direction. That's what it is. It's not feeling sorry. It's not justifying your sin. Oh, I shouldn't do that. And you continue to head this way. It's to stop dead in your tracks and turn the other direction. To put off the old self and to put on the new self. That's what the Bible says. You got to quit something. The thief quit stealing. Let me say this, Christian, regular repentance should be in your life. Repentance, regular repentance. Paul said, I die daily. You read Paul's writings and he identifies as a sinner at the beginning. And then at the end of his writings, as he becomes more and more mature in his faith, he says, I am the chief of all sinners. He's seeing more and more his need for Jesus. Regular repentance ought to be in your life as a believer. That's one thing that happens when you get saved. I didn't understand that because I read the Bible. It happened to me. I experienced it. I got saved and then, man, I had to, every week, every day I'm finding something to apologize to God for. God, I failed you here. I failed you in my language and I failed you in what I'm looking at and I failed you here and God, help me. I repent and I'm sorry for that. It broke my heart to sin against my creator. Somehow we've lost that in the church. So the first thing that happens to you when you get saved is you quit something. The second thing is you start something. What did the thief start? What did the thief start? If you're online, would you type it louder and they're saying it? What did the thief do? He worked. He got an honest job doing honest work with his own hands. That is so 
opposite of a thief, right? A thief comes to take what you work hard for. A thief would rather break into your shed, your home, your car, your life, your bank account than to put in any sweat equity in anything, right? That's what the thief does. He just wants to steal. It's his way of living. It's easier. But now the thief knows Jesus. So he put that off and says, what am I going to do now? If I'm going to provide for my family, I'm going to have to work. So he gets a job, and he gets an honest job, and he starts working with his hands. And guess what? Now he can pay his own bills. Now he can have the things that he used to steal. He can get his life on firm ground. Two things that happen when you get saved. You quit something, and you start something. But that's not where it ends. There's this other magical thing happens when you come to know Jesus. And that's because Jesus is a God who loves others you start being concerned about others. Just happens. Let's look at this verse again. Let the thief steal, steal no longer, but let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have what? Something to share with those in need. You cannot live your entire Christian existence about you. It's never about you. It's about Jesus. It's about others. Love God, love others. He never calls us, love yourself. Somehow in Christianity, that's what happens. We begin to love ourselves. Loving yourself got you in the sinking ship that God had to save you from. Now you're doing an honest job and you got something. Now it's time to give to those who are in need. What is this? This is becoming like God. Three things that happen in your life when you become saved. You stop something, you quit something, and then you start becoming like God. And God is a generous God. See, at some stage in your Christian life, you've got to start thinking about other people. Now, I used to think, man, if I had money, I would give. I had money. I just didn't steward it well. I'll never forget the church that I got saved in the first week that it really hit me that I need to tithe, give 10% of my income. I wrote that tithe check out. And back in that little church, this is what they used to do. Luke, let me tell you what they would do, man. They would come. I got your name right, Luke. Yeah, I did. Um, And they would come and they would take this plate and they would pass a plate. And ushers would come forward. You know what I'm talking about? And they would pass an offering plate. And the offering plate would go down the aisle. And they'd go down the other aisle. And they'd place something nice behind them. And they'd do all that. It was just like the most uncomfortable moment in church, right? Because if you're not giving, then somebody's seeing that, right? It was just so uncomfortable. So we don't do that right here. Um, but I remember being there thinking, I need to give something. What was happening? Well, the thief no longer stole. And he got a job so he could have for himself. And then he realized, I got enough And I need to be giving to other people. I need to share. And I used to think, man, if I made more, if I had more, then I could give. And that particular day, I remember putting that tithe check in the offering plate. And the thought really hit me. When it got to my aisle, the thought hit me. If I put this in here, I may not have gas money to get to work. But somehow my gas money to get to work, it didn't matter people were going to hell. So I laid in that plate and I went on. See, I lived in Mary and I worked in Murfreesboro in a factory and I didn't make a lot of money. I remember thinking, I hope I can get to work this week. (laughs) Man, I'll tell you what happened to me. Sunday afternoon, this was my experience. Sunday afternoon, there was a knock at my door. And then some unexpected income came in that was a whole lot more than I wrote that tithe check for. I didn't have a problem getting to work that week. That's just how it played out in my life. See, at some point in your life, you got to quit thinking about yourself. And you start having compassion and concern for others. Remember that waitress I was telling you about? The four pastors sitting at a table at the beginning of the sermon? She shared with me that she was raising her siblings. Mom wasn't in the picture and dad wasn't in the picture. I said, I know how I'm going to pray for you now. I stood back up, put my hand on her shoulder, and I just began to pray that God would be the provision. 
that God would provide for her. Raising her siblings that were much younger. She wanted her mom's heart to come back to God, wanted that so bad. So we prayed for that. Sat down at the table and it was time to, they brought the bill out. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, yeah, she's going to get a $100 tip. Just write that on there. Hand it to her. She saw that and she said, no. No. I said, what? She said, no, that's too much. I said, you're trying to raise your siblings. That's not too much. And you need to understand that Jesus and God are here and they just want to bless you. At some point, you've got to quit thinking of yourself. Start thinking of others. The Bible calls us the salt of the earth. And it says, what happens if the salt has lost its savor? It will never lose its savor if you obey Jesus. And Jesus says this, when you get saved, there's something you have to stop. What have you quit? What have you put off? Do you look like the same person when you first accepted Christ? Something's wrong because you haven't learned that in Christ. It's not what the Bible teaches. God calls us all to quit something, to start something, and to become like Him. When you raise children and you have kids and grandkids, you know, they come out and say, oh, they look like this one, oh, they look like that one. Who do you look like? Do you look like your Heavenly Father? Right now, all over this room, I know they're going to bring the house lights down. I'm just going to ask you a couple questions. You can stay in your seat. You can come to an altar. What have you stopped? What have you stopped since you met Jesus, since you were saved? What have you stopped? We're going to be praying that this morning you would be emptying out yourself. I'm going to give Robert an opportunity to sing this chorus as you pray that God would empty you of whatever that thing is God is calling you to stop. Empty me Empty me Let the thief stop stealing. Won't you fill me Let the drunkard quit drinking. With you Let the gossip gossip no more. What have you stopped? Empty me. Feel, won't you feel me with you, with you? What have you stopped? With you. Stop gossip. Stop slandering. With you. Stop being angry. Stop being bitter. Stop being selfish. Stop lusting. Stop fornicating. Stop getting high. Stop being prideful. What have you stopped? Put off the old man. The thief goes in the grave. The drunkard goes in the grave. The gossip and the slander and the idler goes in the grave. What have you stopped? If you're saved today, you've got to stop something. But, but it's not just enough to clean your house and stop it. You've got to fill your life with things. That's why God starts something. If you're truly saved today, what have you stopped and what are you starting? What have you started to do? What is God calling you to do today? Be kind. Are you kinder today now that you know Jesus? 
Be an encourager. Build people up with your conversation. You started that? What have you started? What has He started in you? The good work that He created in you. What has He started in you? How are you different? What has He started? I can read the Bible. Have you started that? You started praying with other folks? You started having faith and believing? Have you started forgiving? Have you started serving? Have you started um, caring for other people? Everything you make really goes to your own household? Everything? Like you work hard 40, 50, 60 hour weeks and every bit of that you use for yourself? Yet God has given so much. Blessed, so amazing. coming like him church you're in a dying church this morning people all over this room dying to self and living to Christ we're on this journey of crucifying so you got to stop something and you got to start something and when you're putting things off and you're putting things on you will become like him and when you cross that finish line well done thy good and faithful servant enter into the joys of the Lord He came to give you life and life more abundantly, not just forgiveness. Father, we come to you this morning asking that you would help us, me included, stop. Help us stop being like that old person that didn't know you. God, you rose from the dead so we could start becoming like you. God, put on us a willingness to serve a willingness to give, a willingness to sacrifice, a willingness, God, to to seek you, be hungry for you. Lord, because at the end of the day, we want to put on true righteousness and true holiness. We want to be like you. It's in Jesus' name we pray.